Circle of Hope Network, doing life and being church together. We're invited in one of the hymns in the hymnal, Lord, in the morning thou shalt hear my voice ascending high. To you I will direct my prayer. To you I will lift up mine eye. And I am so thankful that you would come and join us this morning to do just that. And I thank you so much for the music that began our journey this morning the songs that reminded us how truly our God is holy and he is worthy and we can't wait to meet him face to face. This morning I want to talk about prayer. That's our vital connection to all power and all authority in ministry and in life and in hope and certainty. And I want to have you claim that you hear we gathered in this place are a catalyst, a beginning again, a revival anew for our Mansas Conference. What we have learned through all the different speakers and how the Holy Spirit has said, this is a tool you can use to be a better witness, a more fruitful witness, a more bold witness, we would carry out back home to our churches. And that promise that Ellen White saw in vision of the Adventist movement as points of light that grew stronger and multiplied ever brighter uh, would take place. So again, I want to bow our heads in prayer and um, let God speak to our hearts. Dear Father, we've known about prayer for a long time. Sometimes we yet, though, are not as solid in our certainty of your answers. So today, Lord, again, I join Pastor Maxie's voice in asking that you speak to each heart in the way that you would desire. We thank you, Lord, that you are near and that you have the right answer for each one of us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I hope um, that for those of you who have heard these stories that um, you will claim them brand new. You see, what God offers us in scripture is certainty that the connection through prayer is vital and alive and powerful. But here's a story of a church that wasn't completely certain. You see, it seems that in a small community not so far away, there was a nightclub that opened on Main Street and the church was concerned about the impact it would have on the community. So the church got together at prayer meeting. They prayed all night, Lord God Almighty, burn down the, the, like, the nightclub. Whereupon lightning struck and it burned to the ground. The owner of the nightclub burned, uh, burn, burned in his heart with anger and so he took the, the church to court for destroying his business establishment. So you know this must have taken place south of the border, right? Whereupon the church denied responsibility. The judge in his ruling said, I don't know where the guilt lies, but I can tell from the discussions we've had that the nightclub owner believes in prayer while the church does not. Oh, that's pretty difficult, isn't it? We can learn from God's word and we don't want to repeat this story. And what I want most hope for us and hope for us today is that we be certain that when we pray to God Almighty, he hears and he answers and that we can live in that certainty. So I'm going to take you to Daniel chapter 9, verses 4 to 19, where there is a prayer set in the context of prophecy, a powerful prayer that made a difference. And I want to invite scripture and God's voice through it to give us certainty to replace any doubt or any thought of what might be our failure that might we might reflect to God and not claim his answers to prayer. So the prayer continues verses 4 to 19. We're not going to read 
all of those verses, but I invite you later to read the entirety of, of Daniel 9, and you might even want to back up and read both chapters on either side and reclaim our Adventist hope. Daniel says, starting in verse 4 of chapter 9, And I prayed to the Lord my God, and made confession and said, O oh Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments, a friend this morning, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets. Now to verse 9. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. To verse 17 now. Now therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplication, and for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear, open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O oh Lord, hear, O oh Lord, forgive, O oh Lord, hear and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. First of all, I want you to recognize the power of this prayer in the setting of its context, which is represented in, and recorded in verses 1 to 3 of Daniel 9. And I would like to extend that context to where we are in Earth's history right now. So as I read Daniel's history, I hope you will recognize our history as we see the world preparing, God preparing the world for his soon arriving. So Daniel 9, 1 through 3 is the impetus for this prayer. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans in the first year of his reign. So we might say in the reign of our government leaders or the rulership or the leadership. But here Daniel says, I, Daniel, and so you and I understand by the books, the numbers of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah, the prophet, that he would accomplish and here Daniel has a 70-year prophecy in the desolations of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. You see, Daniel was systematically and carefully and deeply studying God's word. He was seeking for the revival and reformation of his people and the rescue and restoration of their ministry to those in the, around them. And we too are seeking that. We are anticipating the return, the eminent, I love that word, eminent, it means at the door, return of our Savior to take us home to heaven. And so I would like to commend to you a few for this morning, secrets from this prayer, and then I invite you to study the prayer and find more secrets, more understandings of prayer that will draw you closer and closer and more certain in who God is. The first one is to confess your need to God. So often what we do is commend ourselves to God, but what Daniel says here is, I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession. And if you want to run your finger down the prayer, we'll start verse six. This is what Daniel says, we have not heeded your servants the prophets. Verse seven says, unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. 
Israel, spiritual Israel, has not been faithful to God Almighty. Verse 9, we have rebelled. Verse 10, we have not obeyed. Verse 11, all Israel has transgressed your law. Another translation of Daniel 9, verse 11 says, but we have sinned terribly by rebelling against you and rejecting your laws and teachings. We have ignored the message your servants, the prophets, spoke to us. The Hebrew for rebellion is to literally turn our backs and think that our ways are better than God's ways. To think that we know better than God? Certainly not. But this is what happens as we gently and quietly drift away into our own thoughts and our own ideas and why God invites us back to his word. Now, I don't know if this has ever happened in your life, and you may have a story like mine, but as I was growing up, I have always loved animals and especially horses. And I desperately wanted a horse as a preteen. We had moved to Kentucky, and if you know about that state, that's the land of horses. And of all things, we had a pasture and a small stable, so shouldn't we have a horse? So I would beg my dad, please, Daddy, I am responsible now. Will you please get me a horse? So one day, he, got, he rented a horse trailer and he went off to a horse auction without me. I think he thought I wouldn't be a very helpful uh, shopper there because I had made specific requests. I wanted a horse that was part quarter horse because they are sturdy and solid and part Arabian because they are beautiful and swift. Not only did I want this type of horse, I wanted a chestnut horse with a black mane and tail, white stockings, and please, Daddy, a star on its forehead. So I'm showing you this picture because this is what I hoped for. When I came back, when Daddy came back, he had two horses. One was a, a big, tall Tennessee walker mare, an older horse, who was in foal. I completely dismissed her, she was too old. The other was a red Tennessee, not Tennessee Walker, a quarter horse who daddy brought home because the horse was injured as it was unloaded from the trailer and so its fetlock had been torn. And daddy was sure that he could nurse the horse back to health and sell it and pay for my horse. And so he and the neighbor took uh, that horse, who we called Red, to another pasture, and I was allowed to come while they were there and help treat the, the horse, who responded quite well to that care. The rule was, though, I could not be there alone, but I did wait until one day when Daddy and the neighbor were gone and I hopped on back of Red I didn't have a halter or a saddle, and I rode around the neighbor's corral three times. And I didn't get hurt, if you're expecting that part of the story. And it was wonderful until the third round around the corral, and I recognized it hit home that I had rebelled against my dad. So often, when we go to God, instead of confessing our need to him, we commend ourselves. Lord, um, we might say, even when we're older, I picked up all my toys, or maybe we would say it this way, I did all the right things I was supposed to do today. Or uh, the nominating committee called, Lord, and I accepted all seven positions that they gave me. And what God wants of us is that we confess our need to him and be honest with him and with ourselves. We aren't worthy, but we can praise God for who he is and for his goodness, and that is what Daniel does. And it's interesting, he says, O Lord, in verse 4 of Daniel 9, O Lord, the great and awesome God. And what he uses here, the name for God is Yahweh. 
He uses that name for God seven times and nowhere else in the book of Daniel. The ultimate authority of the universe, the self-existent one, the creator, the author of our very existence. He calls on the God who is able and who is willing to hear and answer. So run your finger now down back. We'll start with verse 7. Daniel said, Lord, righteousness belongs to you. Verse 9, to the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness. Verse 12, he has confirmed his words which he spoke against us. His words are sure. The consequences of our rebellion will take place. Verse 14, the Lord our God is righteous in all your works. Verse 15, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand. He is a God of miracles, huge miracles that change history. Well, I did confess to my dad that I had ridden red. Um, he was sold. Uh, the consequence of my skill and my actions didn't result in me keeping the nearly perfect horse for myself. God knows what's best for us. The next secret is that we should claim God's promises. In verse 18 of Daniel 9, the prayer that Daniel is praying, can you imagine him from Sabbath school class and seeing the pictures of Daniel turned in prayer to God as he says, O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive, O oh Lord, listen and act. In verse 18, we do not present our supplications before you because of your righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. We can trust him to provide the right answer for our needs, a wise answer, and we can, re we can anticipate his answer. Did you notice in verse 19, I don't know what translation you have in front of you, but there's a shift in the attitude of the prayer to complete surrender and supplication before Almighty God, submission to boldness before the throne of God. And in some and many uh, versions, and the Hebrew bears it out, there are exclamation points. O oh Lord, listen. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, hear and act. Remember, Daniel knows that the time of prophecy is completed, is, is before him. And he is inviting God to step into history. He is joining God in the petition to step into history. He is brave to ask Almighty God to step into history because he knows God. You remember his journey as you read through Daniel, the book of Daniel. He was in exile and God exalted him to leadership in a foreign government. The government changed and he is again invited into leadership. He prays when he shouldn't pray. He stays faithful and visible in his supplication and his surrender to Lord God Almighty as a witness to Lord God Almighty. And so this prompts him to boldness because Almighty God is able and he is certain of that. Remember that Tennessee Walker horse that I kind of dismissed? I was kind to her. Well, eventually that foal was born. Dad woke us all up in the middle of the night, and we were there when Cinderfella was born. He was a chestnut. He had a black mane and tail. He had four white stockings and the best white star on his forehead that a horse ever had. He remained a stallion all his life because he was so gentle. We played with him from that day on to his arrival. 
And so we could ride him without a bit or a, a, the proper saddle, or we could ride him with one, and he, he listened and responded. I always thought, as I thought of my dad and, and this whole story, and my mom, that she would accept another animal into our family, that dad was wonderful to get me a horse. But when I look back and as I studied this prayer and recognized how God can answer questions and, and requests of him so powerfully, God was the one that made that little colt a chestnut with a white star, not my daddy. And he knows what we need in a way. Now, I guess now I'm wiser. Maybe I didn't need a horse. But to me, it was a blessing. And, and it, I learned that Daddy was trustworthy as well as God because I had been praying. Can't I have a horse? I will take care of him. Daniel is certain of God. And the most amazing thing happens. And so now I want to read in your hearing and have you follow along. In Daniel 9, verses 20 to 24. While I was speaking, praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering, and he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. The answer comes from heaven. It is the biggest and best and most wonderful answer. It's not the one Daniel has been anticipating. He wants release from captivity for his people and for them to be witnesses as God designed. But God gives the answer to humanity's need. Jesus' mission is prophesied. We are invited to confess our needs to God, to praise God for who he is, to claim God's promise to answer, and to answer in the way that is best for us, and to anticipate his answers, to live in trust and certainty and hope and possibility. So on a personal level, if you've been praying about something, please know God comes to your rescue. He sets in motion the right answer for your need. His timing is wise and right and good and personal. Stand in awe of him and wait for him to answer for his people. We are a people with a divine calling, wonder of wonders, almighty God, your rebellious people, your small little group in Mansas, Nunavut, have been called to preach a message that is life-changing. Jesus is soon to come. Claim. Call on the Lord. Together may we unite in prayer to call on the Lord as Daniel did and to be bold because that is God's invitation to us. The time is at hand. The God who authored our very existence will rescue us. 
he will take us and a multitude of those we witness to to the heavenly kingdom. And that picture in Revelation of the great multitude before God's throne praising him and saying salvation belongs to our God and to the lamb who sits on the throne will take place. May we each one be in that picture with our neighbor, our friend, our school associate, our work team member be there on that throne. Shall we pray? Lord God Almighty, the one who created and recreates us, we come before you in failure and confession and yet certainty of your, for certainty of your forgiveness and your answers. We are bold because you have invited it and we ask your anointing again this day on these your people. Lord, fulfill your prophecy. Please, Lord Jesus, come soon. May we not be alone when we meet before your throne. May we have friends and neighbors, a vast multitude of witnesses that have spread the news of your soon coming across our mission territory. We thank you that we live in that anticipation and that purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Circle of Hope Network, doing life and being church together.